no part of academic study that doesn't have its gatekeepers. Sure. Um, and you know, that's true in particular for the study of the Greek and Rome, ancient Greek and Roman worlds, um, in which you know, I, I still, when I was an undergraduate, at, I still saw the end of that sense that this was really an elite white man subject. Uh, and it wasn't for women, it wasn't for people of colour, and it wasn't for ordinary people. Uh, and it had operated, it, you know, it, it had tried to operate in a way to keep keep the people it didn't want out. Now, actually, the good thing about gatekeepers is that they're always terribly inefficient. <laughs> yes. <You know>? They're <laughs> useless at it, and they've forgotten that gates open as well as shut. Yeah. And, uh, but you do need a bit of of strength, resilience, and kind of boldness, I think, to say, thank you very much, but this gate is going to be open from now on. Hello, everybody. This is the Samsung Galaxy Tab S9 Series Jaipur Literature Festival. We are here at the VFS Global Friend of the Festival Lounge, shooting the Jaipur Bites podcast in collaboration with the history series of Ithyasology. <laughs> I am Eric Chopra, your host. I'm here with my co-host, Sartha Kaushik, and we are here with the iconic Mary Beard. It's great to be here. <laughs> yeah. um, so Mary Beard is, as I said, an iconic classicist. Um, she has spent most of her life um, digging through our ancient pasts and bringing them alive uh, for all of us, you know, this this colourful understanding of the past is thanks to you and your work. So, well, I've played my part, but I think that um, there's lots of people yes. right now who are really doing exciting things with the ancient past. So yes, but, not but, just me. Not just yes, me. but of course, but you really, you know, you've you've actually, I think, because you've been so front facing for the public that you've made it possible for people to imagine that there is an investment in the past that they can do. Yeah, I, I hope that's right. And, yeah. and, uh, and that goes for all ages. It goes for kids, but it also goes for grey-haired grannies <laughs> like me. Um, there's plenty for everybody. Uh, and there are important things to discuss, and we can all join in discussing them in the ancient past. In some ways, it's quite a good, safe space mm -hmm. for discussing modern problems. Right, of course. So, Mary, where we wanted to start was to actually look at your own beginnings. Um, where was it? What moment in time did you think this is for you and this is what you want to do? I have actually got a single moment, oh. right? I do have one. Uh, and I was five, five years old. And I, I lived with my mum and dad a long way from London, middle of the countryside. Um, beautiful, but pretty remote. And my mum decided that by the time I was five, I should see London. So we went on a trip to London. Um, and we went, amongst other places, to the British Museum. And like a lot of five-year-olds, I think, I wanted to see Egyptian things. Mm. I wanted to see mummies, yes. right? Um, and we saw them. But then we went to the Egyptian Everyday Life Gallery in the British Museum. And not many people will remember what museums were like in 1960. You know, and they weren't friendly for kids. The cases were very high. Um, and there was not much attempt to meet a young audience. Um, but we were trying to look at these cases. And my mum spotted at the back of one case a piece of carbonized Egyptian cake that was 3,000 years old. And she said to me, there's a piece of cake 3,000 years old there. Uh, and I remember thinking, I want to see that cake, you know? Um, yeah, that was even better than the mummies, you know, the idea that there's cake. But of course I couldn't see it. We got a lot of bags with us. Mm. She tried to hold me up so I could look at it, but it was hard. Uh, and we were struggling a bit, and a guy walked past just as this was going on, um, and he said, um, what was I trying to look at something in particular? And I said, yes, that bit of cake, you know? <laughs> and he must have been a curator, 
because he put his hand in his pocket, he got a key out, he opened the case, and he lifted out the bit of cake and put it right in front of my nose. And I remember just thinking, wow. You know, it was a wow moment. Um, and in a way, in retrospect, it was a wow moment for two reasons. One is, it was very exciting, yeah. you know, being you know, eyeball to eyeball with a 3,000-year-old piece of cake. That was wonderful. Um, but also there was a message in what he did. You know, there was a message in the idea of opening the case. This guy, I've got no idea who he was. He's probably long dead. Um, he saw a kid wanting to see something. He got his keys out and he got it out for her. And that has become a bit of a message for me, I think, in the decades that followed. Accessibility of history um, came about because, um, uh, you know, reading your work, watching you, it's like um, uh, history's put its uh, arm around my shoulders, taking me for a nice meandering walk when in school it was, uh, you know, the intimidation of, of history. We've all grown up with hurdles that we had to literally bound over uh, to... Um, access, I think, stories that excited us. And yeah. as you said, the excitement of yeah. 3,000 years of history being in front of you is, yeah. is something um, that you embody so beautifully and, yeah. uh, and, and so simply. I think the elegance yeah. of simplicity yeah. is, uh, is sort of the hallmark of your work. So is that where, I mean, uh, it came in that, that you will be accessible as far as... Unlocking cases. Yeah, yeah. Un literally unlocking yeah. the cases of stories yeah. for us. Yeah, I mean, uh, I like to think that, you know, there was a very long time between being five and seeing the cake and do my first <laughs> exactly. television program very yeah. long time um but it was a moment that stuck that really stuck with me and you know i think there are wonderful school history teachers out there absolutely but there are also some bits of history and the way it's conventionally taught that that actually does its best really to remove that excitement and i i think that if you if, if you just let people feel excited yes. and you open a space in which it's okay to feel excited you, you think be. there's there's gatekeeping uh, mary you think there's uh, as you said the fearlessness with which you write is something uh, that is lauded i mean <laughs> oh shut up dear is not really <laughs> one no, of the things right. that <laughs> historians would say no. um but uh, you know the, the fearlessness of 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 your work is uh, is something that uh, makes me wonder whether uh, we've most of the time faced a lot of gatekeeping where... Yeah. I mean, there, there's no part of academic study that doesn't have its gatekeepers. Sure. Um, and you know, that's true in particular for the study of the Greek and Rome, ancient Greek and Roman worlds, um, in which you know, I, I still, when I was an undergraduate, at, I still saw the end of that sense that this was really an elite white man subject uh, and it wasn't for women, it wasn't for people of colour and it wasn't for ordinary people uh, and it had operated, it, you know, it, it had tried to operate in a way to keep, keep the people it didn't want out. Now, actually, the good thing about gatekeepers is that they're always terribly inefficient. <laughs> yes. you know, they're <laughs> useless at it, and they've forgotten that gates open as well as shut. Yes. And, uh, but you do need a bit of, of strength, resilience, and kind of boldness, I think, yes. to say, thank you very much, but this gate is going to be open from now on. I yeah. And I, 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 in some ways, I think, was driven by that. Yeah. No. But they will enter with a whoop and a holler uh, <laughs> whenever they're questioned. I mean, uh, you know, you you did say that uh, there was this thing about uh, a senior Roman uh, soldier being black, and you said uh, that is entirely possible. And then, of course, um, uh, Twitter did its thing on you. <laughs> so the gatekeeping literally goes into the past as well. It seems. Uh, that's partly, I mean, or it uses the past to justify itself, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, and I think that, that, as I say, it's happily, it's quite easy to overturn it. I mean, you need, you need 
some fellow travelers. You, 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 you know, it's hard to do on your own. You need support. Um, but it is gatekeeping, particularly, I think, gatekeeping that rests on um, brain power, on the academy, on, in, on an intellectual gatekeeping. It's very vulnerable to, um, you know, to kids from outside that saying, look, I can read Latin and Greek as well as you can. You know? and, and I think I think it should be on a t-shirt actually. Mary be it says, let them see cake, because that is how you unlock <laughs> <laughs> love for history. Um, no, I, I mean I think that's absolutely right. And I think one of the things that what I wanted to do with television mm. is not do what a lot of television producers mm. want to do, which is to say, now in this documentary, mm. we're going to show you things that you'll never be able to see yourself yeah. because we are very privileged <laughs> and we are going to go behind closed doors yeah. and take you. Now, you know, there's always a little bit of an excitement in that. But what I like to do is to show people things that they can see. You yeah. know, they can go to a museum and they can look at it and you can say, try looking at these ordinary things this way. Don't just walk past them. Exactly. They're actually quite interesting and I'll show you why I think they're interesting so I think you know it means I think helping people collaboratively to look and to see and to enjoy is I think what's absolutely important. and I think you keep that excitement alive I mean we were discussing this earlier I was even speaking to Sathak about this and you that the way in which one imparts their passion is equally important and there is this um, video in which you're teaching your students Roman numerals and you're telling them, well, we speak about Roman numerals, but who even uses them? But there are certain instances in which you use them. And then you show David Beckham's arm and the tattoos on his arm. And you say, look at this. There is a Roman numeral date on it. And then you go to Latin and you speak about how we can figure out how the Latin language was pronounced through misspellings. Yeah. So, yeah, so how, yeah. where is this, where was your, um, you know, this, this craft of teaching honed? Where did you think that this is how you would like to teach? I, I think I got the sense, and this is a bit like gatekeeping really. I got the sense that a lot of the way that we teach students or we talk to the general public or we teach kids at high school. Um, a lot of that is quite defensive. You know, it's quite a lot of it is about saying, I'm going to show you that I know a lot and you don't. Um, and uh, I, I will let you into this, but you've got to play by my rules. Now, you know, in the end, if you're going to learn Latin and Greek, you know, I'm the first to confess that sometimes you have to play by the teacher's rules. But it's, it, it's I think, I mean, what I wanted to do was convince people that they were already in this subject a bit. I mean, I, I have to say um, that this took place about 10, more than 10 years ago when David Beckham was slightly more kind of fashionable <laughs> than he is now. I think if you got a group of 15 year olds and started talking about David Beckham, now they might think that you're a bit, um, a bit past it. Um, but it was, uh, I, I, I'd agreed, it was, it was actually on a television program, which um, a celebrity chef in the UK, Jamie Oliver, had set up and he'd, tr he, he'd hired um, public figures to try to inspire uh, a group of children who'd failed at school. They were 15 and they were all failures. Now, actually, I have to say it was one of the most difficult things I've ever done, you know, but, you know, we, we all walked in and there were, we divided, the teachers divided into those who thought, well, this is going to be easy, you know, and those who thought, oh my goodness me, you know, this is terrifying. And it was terrifying, but they taught me a lot. And in, in some ways, I mean, it's interesting that you remember and have seen the, the David Beckham tattoos because I, I saw talking to them how they, they were already actually invested in some ways in the ancient world, but they were just a bit 
a bit too scared uh, and a bit too out of it mm. to say. And I think one of the things that that came a bit later, and I, I don't know if it was ever made it to the final program, um, but they got very, very interested in Roman numerals. Now, actually, I have to say, I am not the slightest bit interested in Roman numerals, you know, X, L, V, 1, 2, 1, 1, 1, you know, and I still, you know, after yeah. having learned Latin for 50 years, I still think, oh, what the hell's that? Yeah. Um, but they got really interested, and we did loads of them. Eventually, as, as I got to know them better, I said, look, why are you so interested in Roman numerals? And they said, uh, and I'm not sure if this is the same on Indian film and television, but it's certainly true in the UK, that the date of a movie or the date of a television program at the very end of the credits is written in Roman numerals. And they never knew, they'd never been able to work out when these programmes were made. Now, I suspect that's part of the point, yeah. that the television makers don't want you to know that this was actually made <laughs> 15 years ago. Um, but they wanted to decode this. And I, I thought, you know, look, it is all around us. You know, it's all around us and we haven't gone, we haven't gone halfway to meet people's interest or to let them say, there's this stuff at the end of the credit, and I can't tell you, you know, I don't know when the program's made. It, there's also, I mean, uh, the fascinating bit about uh, 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 the deliciously uh, subtle subversion of pop culture to uh, get your things across. I mean, uh, the Grand Tour episode with Captain Slow, <laughs> James May coming to you was, <laughs> was incredibly subversive. <laughs> I mean, I will talk to anybody about the ancient world. I mean, yes. uh, you know, uh, legally, I mean, I'm sure there are one or two people that, you know, I wouldn't fancy a conversation with. But <laughs> I, I think it was, you know, but when I talked to to James May, it was, was it, it was still, was it the Grand Tour or was it? It was the Grand Tour. It was the Grand Tour. And I've become quite a friend of James May since then right and I, i'd never watched the grand tour i can't you know <laughs> you know uh, i i more chariots than cars i'm I, assuming you know i'm i have no interest in the motor car yes. uh, whatsoever <laughs> but it, it was it was good fun actually to talk to james about you know about his view of rome or our communal, our shared view of Rome, about spectacle. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I later invited him back to a television program I was doing about tourism <laughs> uh, and, you know, what he thought the point of, you know, as someone from the Grand Tour, what he thought the point of tourism was. And in, if, you, if you let people see that there is an intersection between yeah. history and all Absolutely. kinds of bits of their own and popular culture. You know, it's not the same. It, you know, studying the ancient world isn't just about talking to James May, but it's partly about that. Also, I think, um, you know, um, uh, the tome about uh, about Roman laughter, you know, <laughs> that is something that excites me no end, and I would like to ask you about that. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but of course, you know, the subversion bit, I would like to come back on, uh, to that. Uh, at, ta at a time when uh, it was not even on the horizon, it was literally like Mary Be Beard walked uh, so a Philomena kunk could could run uh, the, the delicious <laughs> subversion of uh, of what you did and taking it to an extra. I, I have to confess, I have never been invited on to come. <laughs> but I think that, you know, I've just said very bravely, I'd talk to anybody about the ancient world. I'd be so scared. You, know, you don't escape from Philomena Kunk, you know, looking good, do you? I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's knowing humiliation, I think. Mary, you spoke about how so many of these documentaries are you being on TV and you sort of bringing the ancient past alive has also been popularly received. But a lot of other documentaries, for example, even a few that are made on in, in ancient forts and fortresses, they would always start with, well, welcome. Here we'll show you a ghost. <laughs> and they take you through this path and alley of these haunted mansions and monuments. Yes. And then halfway through, you realize you've learned nothing about the monument, but you've learned all about the said ghost who died there by crushing right. diamonds and swallowing them. Yeah. 
Yeah. How do you strike a balance between being well so academically rooted yet what one may consider a popular historian? Well, it's hard, but it is a you know it's a bit like the David Beckham tattoo. Yes. You know, you 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 have to talk to people in a way that's going to interest them. You have to assume they're not stupid. Right? Most people who turn on a documentary about the Romans are not thick, you know. They might be ignorant about the Romans, but they've only turned the telly on because they're a bit interested. And you have to assume that they're intelligent. And I think that, um, I, mean, I think it follows from that. I mean, people often say, say to me, look, um, it must be really very different um, talking to you know a million people or so on television from talking to Cambridge University students, you know, and I think it isn't really. Um, you know, Cambridge University students are, as it were, forced to go to your lectures, so um, you don't you don't have to win them in what, that way, but they can walk out, and you know, in their first year, they also don't know much, and you have to provide a framework. I think both so that the kind of stuff that you've got to say means something isn't just you know I'm now going to display how knowledgeable I am and I don't really care about you but also I think what's key for me is giving people um, the tools that they can then go and use themselves you know so that it doesn't just stop with the tele program. And the, the one example that I know has been successful because people have written in to say is uh, about um, what happens upstairs in a Roman house. Now, you go to a kind of a very ruined ruin in Roman Britain, or you go to a less ruined ruin in Pompeii, but you still don't see upstairs. You know, most people. I think come away with the impression that Romans lived in bungalows. No, no, they did not. These houses had upper floors, and one of the little—it wasn't even a trick. It was a, such an obvious point. I remember walking around a house in Pompeii and pointing to the stairs. You could see in the corner of the room there was no upper floor, but you could see three steps going up, and that that would, in in the end. Um, have landed you up if it hadn't been destroyed. It would have landed you up upstairs. And you know, part of the point was saying you always have to think what happened upstairs in these houses. And people have written in to say, "Gosh, now you've pointed that out. I see steps everywhere in Roman houses. I've suddenly realised that I can do that too. You know, I can say, oh, that must have been going to the upper floor. And you know, it's a in partly it's a trivial point, um, but it's very simple, and it opens up a, a really different view of what it looked like, what it felt like to be in a Roman home. And the ringing of laughter inside is what you've studied quite intimately. You want to tell us a little about that? I, about laughter, what's the yeah. process of that? Um, well, I did write a book on Roman laughter. Um, it's quite an academic book, actually. Um, as all, all books on laughter end up being not funny. You know? Taking the giggles away is, from it. The trouble is you, you set out to write a funny book about laughter and you always fail. Um, I, I, it, they came from a series of lectures I'd done in, in California. And um, I just finished working on the Roman victory parade or triumph. Since I'd spent years of my life kind of trying to work out what the, how Romans celebrated and with what cost military victory. And I thought, God, I want to do something different. You know, I don't want to do all this military stuff. I don't want soldiers and, you know, posh white men in chariots and all this kind of stuff. I know what I'll do. I, it just came out of my head. I thought, I'll do laughter. I'll do what made the Romans laugh. Um, and... At the time I gave the title and promised the lectures, I had no idea what I was going to say. I just thought, look, one thing we know is that laughter is an extremely important cultural indicator. You know, We know that as soon as we go to a foreign country. We know people laugh at different things. And we also know how embarrassing it is. And uh, we know what an important kind of 
includer or excluder it is. And I'm sure we all know about the experience of pretending to laugh at a joke we haven't understood. Because if you don't laugh at the joke you haven't understood, you look as if you're on the out crowd. And I wondered, so what, what makes... How, how did that work in ancient Rome? Can we get at that? And I think that um, you you can a bit. I, 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 it's always very elusive. You're never there when anyone's laughing. Um, but I thought there were all sorts of really interesting differences about what topics um, jokes covered. And... Um, I also thought it was very interesting that Romans were much more interested themselves in the jokester, in the person who tells the joke, than in the person who laughs. They're interested in the production of laughter. But there is amazing material that people don't know much about. There's a, good, you know, there's a great ancient joke book, sure. you know, with hundreds of, we have to say, I'm afraid, um, mildly funny. <laughs> at, at best, <laughs> mildly funny <laughs> jokes. I will tell you one because I can't resist. Yes. Um, and I'll tell you a short one. Um, it's a guy who comes along the street and he meets um, meets one of his friends. Um, and he said, God, I, but you're, you're dead. I thought you were dead. And the man replies, no, look, you can see I'm not dead. I'm, you know, I'm here in the street. I'm talking to you. And the first bloke replies... But the person who told me you were dead is much more reliable than you are. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, oh, I'm glad somebody laughed, you know. I, I don't usually get much of a laugh uh, for that. But, it, uh, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's nice that we can join in. But also it's a wonderful instance of a, a huge theme in Roman in Roman joking that we don't have, which is mistaken identity. And you, you, that you, how, how can you prove who you are? And we are very used to being able to prove who we yeah. are. We've got ID. Also, but, I think the prevalence of fake news, it's very tenacious, it seems. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's fake news. The, but it's, it's also, I think, about it always being a question mark about who you are you really who you say you are? Now, we've got an answer. Yeah. We've got an answer to that. For and sure. they didn't have an answer to that. There's also another thing that's sort of uh, uh, been very tenacious, which I think is is Roman graffiti. I mean, uh, <laughs> their ancient version of Kilroy was here is is incredible, is it not? There is, um, you know... <laughs> Body, you know? <laughs> there, there is there's very serious graffiti and there is less serious graffiti and it's Rome, there's predictably uh, bawdy graffiti. <laughs> And, you know, one of my favourites is um, from the town of Herculaneum, which was destroyed in the same eruption as Pompeii in 79 CE, and it's in a lavatory. And on the wall, and one of the last things ever written before Vesuvius erupted, was um, a graffito saying, um, Apollinaris, the emperor's doctor, had a good shit here. <laughs> My God. No, but you talk about this and it makes you realize that the past is quite literally filled with the sensations, human and even dad jokes that we have now. I mean, the, yeah. even the joke about the dead guy and something yeah. like this. There's such typical dad humor. Um, <laughs> but yet again, what I'm finding difficult to digest is that all of these sensations yet again seem to be predominated by a very male-led narrative. Yeah. And, you know, I feel like with your work, you're, of course, yeah. digging through these graves yeah. and, you know, these alleys and archives. But you have been focusing on how important it is to show that our histories included yeah. women yeah. Or, and included anybody who was actually not a yeah. straight male. You know, there was a yeah. story beyond this. Yeah. So how difficult has it been to piece that? I think it, the ancient world is a good example of um, history producing information if you only are prepared to look for it. Yeah. And you know, as the stories I've told so far, I think they show that it's very easy in antiquity to slip into a default position that you're talking about men. You know, men are most of the writers, um, men are most of the jokesters, 
um, uh, we have jokes about women, but not told by women. And, uh, you know, I think, you have to face that, that, that antiquity is for us going to be skewed towards a male view. But that said, if you, if, if you make yourself look for it, you find loads of material about women, about the enslaved, about the people who don't usually get, get into the, the picture. And there are, you can start with some of the kind of simplest things like uh, tombstones, which we've used a lot of in television programs, because you, you get the memorials and the commemoration of ordinary people. Now, we don't know who wrote the text on the tombstone. We never know that. Um, but some of the most vivid women are known through the way they're commemorated. And those are people of all ranks. There's a, a, a wonderful one in Rome, which I'm hoping to make a little radio program about soon, called Alia Potestas. And she's a woman who died. And uh, it turns out, as soon as you get into this quite long eulogy of her, it turns out she'd been living in a threesome with two blokes. Um, and the two blokes, at the end of the tombstone, they say, once she died, we split up. The two blokes split up. Um, but it, over a couple of columns of writing, um, they go through Alia Potestas' appearance. And they, <laughs> they get slightly fixated on her breasts, I'm afraid. Sort of, you, you, there's a bit of, sort of slightly too much disclosure in this tombstone. Um, and they also quite, I think, inadvertently say, um, she was always the first up in the morning of us, of the three of us, and she was always the last to go to bed. You know, and you think, right, because she was doing the housework, wasn't she? Uh -huh. um, but you have this marvellous... Um, kind of lover's evocation of this perfectly ordinary woman. And you also see, you know, the different sorts of households that you have in Rome. You know, this is two guys living with one woman. And, you know, nobody tells you that in the Roman history textbooks. And when you say that they said that they split up, but does that mean that these two blokes were also dating while they were together? Because you're saying that they... The, I'm afraid the tombstone is not explicit. Yeah, but, yeah. But, it has said everything that I, it had to say, except that the two blokes perhaps kissed. Yes, I, 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 I've always thought they did, but I, but I must be honest and say the tombstone allows different interpretations of their relationship. But As a historian, I, I believe you must underline the lack of uh, <laughs> material there. Or, or as any historian would say, they were just friends. They, you know, they're always merely. just friends. There's, there's plenty of just friends <laughs> in ancient Rome. Yeah. And of course, uh, when a woman talks about it, uh, uh, men, uh, the gatekeepers we are talking about, usually uh, get on to the lowest hanging fruit, which is uh, uh, physical descriptions. And uh, you've had quite a few of them, very colorful. <laughs> being thrown at you about your lack, uh, your, your yeah. presentation skills or lack thereof. Uh, yeah, it's, when I first did television, there was a very acerbic, I have to say it was quite clever British TV critic who really hated me. Um, and it, he, every time I did a, a program, you know, in one of the main British newspapers, there was, you know, an appearance assassination. You know, yes. That you know, Mary Beard might take a bit more care with how she looks. I mean, um, she's come, trying to come into our living room. She might brush her hair and look at those teeth. You know, aren't they dreadful? And, he, and you know, she looks you know, fifteen from behind and sixty-five from the front. I mean, just the usual tropes of yeah. male sexism. It to is, which? <laughs> yeah, it is nice reading that kind of thing. You kind of, now I think it's funny, but you know, you pick up the newspaper and you think, what? Yeah. Um, it looks like the back end of a bus, you know. And what was interesting, though, was I did, I, I did fight back. Um, 
But I, and I, I wrote a, an article for the Daily Mail, which is a very conservative um, and not very nice British newspaper, actually. And I said, look, you know, what does, his name's A.A. A. Gill, what does A.A. A. Gill think that I was then 55? The 55-year-old woman looks like, you know, uh, this is what she looks like. She looks like me, right? She's not had work done on her face. She's got grey hair. She hasn't coloured it. This is what I look like. Get used to it. Maybe you're a bit frightened of a woman who knows more than you do, I said. Um, after this article, I expected that I would make no friends. But I did nerve myself to look online at the comments underneath, expecting to see, you know, who does this woman think she is? A.A. A. Gill is completely right. You know, can't she look after herself a bit? You know, et cetera, et cetera. And there were a few of those. The vast majority were on my side and saying, you know, how, you know, really, you know, we, you know, we lived in the world, this was, you know, in the early 20th, first century, you know, we're not in a world any longer where we want history presented by people just on the basis of whether they look like you want them to look. We want to know something. But I realised that what lay behind the agreements that I'd got was that I suspected that a lot of the people who were replying to me were also 50-something women, and they knew that his comments about me were also an insult against them. Absolutely. And that actually, we could, we, sh we could stand together and say, get real. And what was funny was that although I thought, I predicted that he would come out looking like the guy who'd put Mary Beard really in her place. He was the guy who got hammered. You know, people oh, kind wow. of, right. they, they tampered with his Wikipedia page and all, that, you know, all, all the other modern crimes that you can commit. Um, and, um, you know, he went on doing it a little bit, but the, the fight had gone out of him. Yeah. No, yeah. It's, it's also, I think, it's when they think that you're just trying to be somebody outside the conventional way in which they want to perceive you as. And also perhaps think that when a woman is bold, she's just irreverent and perhaps irreverence is not taken. But I think you have been boldly irreverent, rightfully so, even with your approach to the past. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's not such a sacred terrain. No, you you no, let it be no. loose. And you know, I think I'm lucky that I didn't um, that I didn't do much television, certainly, until I was, didn't do any television until I was in my 50s. Mm. Um, because uh, by that stage, I knew I knew stuff, yeah. you, know? I'd, I, you know. I'd done my time, you know, I'd written my PhD, I'd written academic books, I'd written, you know, slightly dull academic papers, and I knew that I was confident in my own yeah. position, you know. People can be wrong, you know, and I'm sure sometimes I'm wrong. Yeah. But I knew that I wasn't stupid. Yes. And I think that is, you know, that's the key. Yeah. To know that what you have got to say is something that you can uphold um, and that you've, you've got authority and that you can speak with authority. And speaking with authority doesn't always mean being serious. You can speak authoritatively while having fun, telling jokes, being yeah. lighthearted. It is, you know, you know, fun is part of authority. It's not opposed to it. And calling back to what you said earlier, if you have something to say and if you say it right, there will be people who stand next to you and, and walk along, which I think is, it must be a great feeling, no? Yeah, and I, I think that, you know, there's all kinds of ways in which um, history is thriving in the UK. Yeah. And it's thriving in a, a way that, touches ordinary people who don't think of themselves as historians. I mean, you know, part of what we're trying to say is everybody's a historian. There isn't anybody who doesn't have some foot in the past. Yeah. You know, couldn't be a human being without being partly a historian. Oh, yes. And our job is to encourage people to see that and to feel to feel that they've got a right to join in. Absolutely. And um, that that we we gain, you know, and democracy gains by us talking 
not necessarily reverently, sometimes funnily, sometimes jokingly, but responsibly Absolutely. about the past. And, and you make it possible for all of us to believe that history is all our stories. So there's three things that we are taking away from this episode. Well, there is a t-shirt that's very popular. When I grow up, I want to be Mary Beard. Now there are two more t-shirts that you must add to this. The other one is, let them see cake, says Mary Beard. And the third one is, I don't care for motor cars. But uh, this has been absolutely brilliant. Um, we, are, we were joined in this episode by the iconic classicist, Mary Beard. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. And it's absolutely wonderful to be here in Jaipur. That's Jaipur Bites, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, if you've got things to say, the, uh, uh, the comment section is open. Uh, opinions <laughs> would be uh, more than welcome. And uh, Mary Beard, this has been absolutely wonderful. If that um, sort of uh, made you chew on some food for thought, uh, remember to chew a little more and see how it tastes. Thank you for watching.